Welcome to Coffee House. This is part three of the Archaeology of Mind by Yak Pangsep. We did parts one and two, and the contents of those are seated firmly within those particular episodes. <laughs> so in this one, though, we are going to be talking about the lust section of our brain, the care system, and the grief system. So as always, we'll go through the contents, and then sometime in the future, we will do a full analysis and uh, big picture. For the whole deal. I probably should have just done those for each section because it would have been worth it, but uh, it's too late now. I have to stick with the with the method and write it right off the cliff like those two ladies in that one movie. Anyway, so into the contents. <laughs> Lustful passions of mind. So there could be something about the, the lust system that actually supports the immune system. So when you're getting regular sex, apparently, it can be of benefit. But the benefits are differential between women and men. Women and men are of different minds for what is important when you're living together. One of the questions that will come up and be discussed later is what trans and bi actually mean in this context, in the context of the brain. The author says he doesn't want to touch on gender role cultural issues, but as we shall see... Other touchstone cultural issues, he certainly will. So, as was the case in the other parts, one of the primary methods for trying to understand what's going on here is by looking at other mammals and using other mammals and their experiences because you can look more deeply into the way their brains work. You can see the kind of analog to the way the human brain works, and hopefully they match up somewhat. So the lust system isn't just its own discrete thing. It links up with other systems in various ways. One example he points out is that if you're subject to starvation, if you're starving, you're far less likely. It undermines sexual arousal. So the lust system will be undermined when you're in that state. Men have a wider region. Again, there are differences between the sexes. Men have a wider region with receptors for testosterone, as you might expect. And curiously, or maybe not so curiously, for different mammal species, when you have the removal of testicles, then you have a certain amount of time wherein they still experience a sex drive. In human males, when their testicles are removed, it takes a longer time for them to lose their sex drive. And the theory is that it's because humans have more complex brains so that particular unwinding has to go through more processes to be able to get there. Men have a, a perfect ratio, the golden ratio of, of women breast to hips. Excuse me, hips to waist. <laughs> it's a 0.73, that's the hourglass, 0.73 ratio of waist to hips. And very interestingly, female hyenas, they are actually very different. So the hyena world is very different from the human world and most, or many other primates at least. So female hyenas, they have external genitalia and they actually have more testosterone than the males and they engage in dominant aggression. So they wear the pants in that species. But also difference in males, they have a preference for places where sex has occurred. Just in general, they have a preference, whereas that preference is very limited in females. Vasopressin and oxytocin have different effects in male and female brains. So say you're trying to create a one-stop shop apothecary <laughs> to try to treat these kinds of issues in men and women, then if you're using those two chemicals, they're going to have different effects in different genders. So you have to be aware of that. And that's a theme that we'll come back to over and over again that will be talked about again later is how psychopharmacology, how important it is to understand these things, to be able to treat them properly. So the author believes that lust is more an emotional system. Of course, uh, this has been mostly about affective neuroscience, so you would expect this. But apparently, you can create this distinction. You can have this distinction between what is based on the emotional system and what is based on just homeostasis, trying to return to homeostasis. And lust, he believes, is part of the emotional system. And something that nobody is going to be surprised about, the male orgasm is apparently more primitive than the female one. The more regions are involved, more regions of the brain and higher order regions of the brain are involved with a female orgasm than the male one. Like I said, stop the presses. So then we get into identity issues. This is as hot button as it gets currently. So he points us again toward other mammals to have a look at it. And he suggests that there is a male brain and a female brain. And you can have a male brain and a female body and vice versa. He also suggests that homosexuality may or may not be biological. But when it comes to the initial suggestion, as we will see, there are a whole bunch of twists and turns that would make a pretzel envious. So he says there's definitely a state of being transgender and just points this out, says 100% there's a state of being transgender. And it always raises the question to me about uh, what's called body integrity dysphoria or body integrity identity disorder. So I know there was another term for it that was uh, fancier, but I can't remember what it is. But this is where people believe that one of their limbs are not their own. 
and so they want them removed. So they, they will go to doctors and desperately plead and say, this is not my arm. I know it looks like it's attached to me, but I need this thing removed. It's not part of me. And so I wonder what the position would be in that particular category. The author goes a step farther here. He says there's a, definitely a state of being transgender and that the biological wisdom that can be expressed by children, parents should listen to. The biological wisdom, that there's some internal biological wisdom. And this whole section, I believe, is just inextricably tinged with the politics of today. You know, the now issue. Because this is the only area, we've been through how many different issues in this book, and this is the only area where he starts just kind of tossing himself headfirst into political issues and making pronouncements, like absolute pronouncements, and just being internally contradictory all over the place. So, so like I said, he suggested there's biological wisdom that parents should listen to, the implication being that there are children that have this biological wisdom to impart unto their parents. He suggests that we see these variations in other animals as well. So it suggests that there's something deeper to it than we realize. In the third trimester is apparently where sex is established in the brain. So it's not until the third trimester that you get the, the sexualization of the brain to the extent that it is at that point, is what I mean. So he wants to distinguish biological sex and psychobiological gender. So this is probably just the classic distinction that was the popular one until recently. Because uh, now activists, like this is behind, <laughs> because activists now would say that uh, no, there isn't this distinction. You can't just say that there's a biological sex and there's a psychobiological gender. You have to say that no, this is just a woman period done. This is just a man period done. But the Y chromosome, of course, that's what men get. They get an XY. Apparently does testosterone in a different way. It's more robust when it comes to the use of testosterone. And the masculinization of the brain and body is mediated by the levels of testosterone early on. But you can have early environmental stressors that can change these in other mammals. So it's been observed in other mammals that if you have environmental stressors, that can affect how much masculinization there is. Everybody is initially female in appearance, and then the testosterone is added and changes it toward the male. There's actually a group in the Dominican Republic, males in the Dominican Republic, that are deficient in DHT. I can't remember what that acronym stands for. My apologies. <laughs> but their bodies have a female appearance with no testicles. They're internal testicles and just a rudimentary penis. And they are raised as girls throughout their childhood. But then the Y chromosome becomes involved at puberty. So it's not until they hit puberty that they start receiving the testosterone necessary to express more masculine traits. And the term for them, I can't remember what the actual uh, Spanish term is, but the term actually means penis at 12. And then you have things like the androgen insensitivity syndrome, which uh, has female genitalia and undescended testicles. So you've got both of those things going on. But here is the thing where we get into all sorts of pretzel level twisting and turning. Stress and environment can create female brain and male body. So this is what's suggested by the author that there is reason to believe there's evidence to suggest that stress and the environment that you grow up in can create the female brain in the male body. Which he sets up this distinction, this distinction that says there's there's an innate sexuality and then there's a not innate sexuality. And that one of those means something and the other one means something else. So you have to look at those things. But if, of course, stress has something to do with or the environment has something to do with increased homosexuality or increased incidences of a female brain being in a male body, then that suggests it's not innate. That suggests that it's something that's learned. It's socialized. So when you want to talk about the biological wisdom that a child might have and that parents should listen to, how on earth would one of these children espousing this wisdom, how on earth would they know the difference between what has been provided to them by wise biology and what, what part of it has been uh, created as a result of the stressors or environment that they experienced? So he suggests, and this is this is the problem, is that, so he references that trans individuals are discriminated against politically, and mostly I think he's referencing other countries, so countries that are more draconian and backwards when it comes to treating trans individuals, because there are still tons of those on earth. But he references that, and then talks about how you can't really make determinations about intrinsic sexual nature based on looking at primates in general, either us or other primates, because gibbons mate for life, gorillas have a harem system, orangutans are sexual isolates, so they'll go and, uh, you know, reproduce, but they won't stick around each other. Chimpanzees have multiple partners, so there are no insights into intrinsic sexual nature, is the point here. Although he's kind of laid out these this 
conclusion of intrinsic sexual nature previously when it comes to transgender individuals. So there's this one trick, apparently, and I think we talked about this in another book, where your index finger is longer than your ring finger, and that means you're more masculine or something like that. And mine is longer, but not, not by the extent that I would, I would generally hope. And then he goes into Freud and penis envy a little bit and kind of dispels some of the ideas that Freud had, that everything was all libidinal pleasures, and talks about the Oedipal complex and all those sorts of things. But his suggestion is that uh, childhood sexual development knowledge is limited, so that's why we can't really know how much of it is related to uh, sexual development when it comes to children. Chapter 8, then we get to nurturing love, the care system. So this is a little happier times. Although not so much because we actually do get in some terrible things here too. But so there's this reference that the joy of mothering can be overshadowed by a negative emotion. But when it's symphonic, when all the pieces are together, it can be the best feeling available in nature. And of course that's not something I will get to experience. But I would venture to say that it likely is the case, at least for some certain amount of time. There's some speculation as to whether the maternal impulse is sublimated sexual urge. Apparently there are a number of theorists that's, that suggest this, but he believes that the care and lust systems are sufficiently distinctive now in the brain that you can look at them separately. So you have a care system that specifically deals with being maternal and nurturing, and then you have the lust system which deals with you know all the questions around reproduction, who to re reproduce with, and all those things. So it's something other than sexual urges. And then we have uh, things about oxytocin, you know, very important chemical in the brain. It's manufactured in greater amounts in female brains than male brains. And it has something to do, he was kind of really careful about how he parsed what oxytocin actually did. It apparently is not something as simple as a care molecule, but it's something that creates like confidence in other people or more willingness to interact with them or something like that. But anyway, so the care behaviors rely on the oxytocin in these rat studies. So the levels of oxytocin are very important for determining how likely they are to engage in these care behaviors. In animals just in general, and I believe humans also in particular, men are more likely to commit infanticide of other children. So not so much their children, but when it comes to other children, they're much more likely to commit infanticide. And right after fertilization, take from this what you will, men are apparently less likely to hurt small animals. So right after they fertilize somebody, then they're super nice to small animals for some reason. Low opiates facilitate mother... There's this weird interplay. So when it comes to motherly behavior, apparently low levels of opiates facilitate motherly behavior, but the levels of oxytocin in the brain limit the effect of opiates. So all these things... I mean, obviously you... <laughs> this is something you could be only studying the way these chemicals interact in different brains and you could have a whole lifetime's worth of study on this but there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here so most human fathers also probably care in less emotional terms and in more routine ways so they don't have the same emotional investment that mothers likely have in offspring and they just engage in it in in a routine as a routine and apparently after your first motherly experience after the first time you become a mother then it improves your maternal skills permanently for the rest of your life. And it was observed in rats. There were these rat pups. When they were abundantly licked, also, when they were young by their uh, mother, it had positive effects for their entire lives. And you'll see that repeatedly, that a lot of these things, you know, really simple things early on, can have profound effects for the rest of their lives, which is kind of the best argument for looking at disparities in the way people grow up and trying to determine, you know, whether there needs to be some reconciliation there. But anyway, that's kind of a side issue. So chapter 9 specifically talks about panic and grief system and the gen genesis of social bonds. So the grief system as a distinct ancient artifact uh, that you can see the analogs of in other mammals. There's this retelling of this very sad story related to the uh, death of, of someone's daughter. And then that segues into discussions of the panic system and the grief system. So specifically, the, the name of it was the panic system apparently is more likely in the literature, but they wanted to call it the grief system because they thought that was more accurate. So grief system as opposed to panic system. So when it's enacted, it makes us feel bereft and miserable. And when it's alleviated, it makes us feel comfort. And apparently it has a huge social component. This is really important, is that when we're in the company of people whom we love and trust, then you're going to have an abated grief system. And uh, this is kind of the mechanism by which it functions. But there are, there's all this discussion about social bonding being an addictive process. This is, I mean, this could be something that is uh, monumental, especially with the rise of social media and kind of the perversion of the social 
instinct and how social media does that is that social bonding can be an addictive process similar to opiates and so it might need to be treated as such. So when an animal feels grief, they seek reunion. Often they'll seek, you know, somebody out, the counsel of somebody, but really it's just the, the social connection with somebody else when they feel this grief. And it has ancient roots in our ancestors. And I don't mean, you know, grandma and grandpa. I mean, in our distant evolutionary relatives, it has these ancient roots. So social separation specifically produces these very strong effects in humans and other mammals. This whole system, the grief system, is designed to forge strong social bonds. Bonds. You can have monkeys who just have a few months of social isolation and they show lifelong issues in myriad ways as a result. And again, he tries to, we talked about the seeking system early on, but he suggests that the infant mother bonds, like those we were talking about in the last chapter, it's not a result of the seeking system. It's more likely from the dopamine opiate bonds. So it's something more akin to that as opposed to just the seeking system. So the grief system is initially objectless. It can even be an abusive individual. It's just um, somebody that you need to attach to, glom on to, to have. But then over time, you know, there are things like uh, the crying circuits, the things that make you likely to cry. You become less sensitive. Those systems become less sensitive as you age and even more insensitive in males just in general. So as they age, but also as a starting point there, those systems are less sensitive. There are three neuropeptides that reduce grief, endogenous opioids, oxytocin and prolactin. And so those chemicals uh, can reduce grief. But when you're talking about medicating this kind of a thing, this, like grief in general, you have to be aware that it's it's the opiate system. <laughs> it's it's those kinds of bonds that are being affected. So just like with any other opiate, the more that you take it, the less effective it is. And it turns out lonely people are much more likely to be addicted to narcotics just in general. And But social relationships specifically are much like opioid addiction. So you get, when you have your social relationships, you get this high. It's a high that dissipates over time. So there, there's less of a positive effect the more that you get it over time. You get separation distress. It's like a, when you go off of opiates, then you get all the negative effects of that, of separation from the opiate. It's the same thing with social bonding, that you get this distress when you have the separation. And when you get artificial opiates, you know, when you're feeling that separation distress, when you get the artificial opiates, then it can reduce that separation distress. Sadness and depression are specifically accompanied by scarcity of brain opiates. But there are ways, you know, to increase it beyond just having more opiates pumped into you, <laughs> such as physical touch. Physical touch is a, a really important phenomenon when it comes to mammals, especially primates. The physical contact promotes comfort, and it releases endogenous opioids in primates. So it can release specifically oxytocin. And when you have this kind of consistent physical touch, like say when you're young, you can have benefits from that that continue for a lifetime. And he worries about something that is happening in our system that is preventing children from having healthy social structures. And one of the things that he suggests is that it's this lack of play, that we're preventing children from being able to have that free playtime. And that's really impacting their ability to create healthy social structures. Then we go into some other discussions about cortisol and how prolonged high levels of cortisol can damage the hippocampus. And cortisol is released when you have like excessive fight or flight or something like that. Uh, there's something, it's, it's just bad when there's a bunch of cortisol around. But it can damage the hippocampus, which is essential for the creation of many types of memories. So it can also be caused by prolonged social deprivation in your early years. And an important concept to kind of jump into here related to this is epigenesis. So this is where you have experience-dependent gene expression. So you have genes that will only be triggered if you have a particular experience. And something that is part of this category is something like an overactive fear system. So if you are subject to particular kinds of experiences, then it triggers the genes that would create your overactive fear system. And then those can have lasting effects for the rest of your life. So somebody who... If you don't have that triggered at all, you can have an overly trusting characteristic for the rest of your life. And if you have it overly triggered, then you can be overly suspicious for the rest of your life of everybody. So again, then we turn back into, toward the end of this chapter, we go back to how the author wants psychotherapy and psychopharmacology to work hand in hand. He's trying to bring those two together, trying to set them up on a blind date and see how it works out. Hopefully, hopefully it does. 
But that was a lot to get through. I have no idea what I'm going to do when I try to do an analysis and a big picture for this particular book. There's just way too much. When I was reading this section, I was just like, I I can't believe how much there is here. I don't know what method I'm going to use to wrap all these things into a a brilliant discussion, you know, as as I tend to. But anyway, so that was those particular chapters about the lust, the care system, and the grief system. Hopefully there's some interesting stuff in there. And then we're going to have a fourth part, which will be the final part, fourth and final, on this beautiful behemoth. And after that, we'll have a discussion episode. I keep wanting to do discussion episodes, and then I I put them off and forget to do it because I I feel like I have to do more more reading. (laughs) But anyway, we will definitely do a discussion episode on that. Maybe jump back to some of the other books that we've had to do some more discussion episodes on those. And in between, I I have started the next fiction, but I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get through that one. I'm reading a book on animation, Disney animation, and a book on Hayao Miyazaki. I don't think we'll do episodes on those. (laughs) But I'm certainly looking forward to the the finale of this particular book and maybe get back into some political stuff because I think we took a, a nice good break away from the political ones and maybe we'll jump back into that. But anyway, thank you very much for listening to this one. I hope to see you on the next one. All right, bye. <laughs>